describing the elusive uh, magic that we're discussing, theater uh, and beyond. The, the, this conversation, I hope, will uh, engage the, some of you that you'll feel free to jump in. I know as I look out there, I see people who are working in live arts but are animators, uh, are uh, visual theater uh, people, are playwrights, are uh, choreographers, uh, a, a mix. And I, I think that the, uh, the festival this year we, tries to go beyond any specific definitions uh, and bring together new parts. We're finding new ways to tell a story or express an idea. I was inspired by the way the, um, people talked about that this morning. Um, and to continue that a bit more, uh, David, first I would have... Um, Mark, before you start, can you mention the Hollywood of my Oh, yes. Uh, I hope it doesn't uh, prevent you from uh, uh, speaking up, but we are live streaming uh, courtesy of HowlRound, uh, uh, which is a project of the Theater Commons, which is a project of uh, uh, Arts Emerson, related to Emerson College. Emerson, yeah, College. Uh, and uh, feel free to tell people that they can, uh, if not join the conversation, Listen and view it at Howl Round, no A, how H O W L R O U N D dot TV. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, David, I've had the, the, the great pleasure of uh, seeing your work and, and um, uh, presenting uh, it for quite That's some time. Yeah. Uh, and have always thought of you as a choreographer, of course, but really like a Southern Gothic novelist. <laughs> uh, a master storyteller with a rich nuance. How do you, how do you do what you do? <laughs> uh, of course you describe yourself as a choreographer, but how, how do you just define yourself? Uh, oh, that's a really good question. Morning. Uh, let's see, it depends on the day, but uh, today, uh, you know, sometimes it feels like choreographer for me is uh, kind of a, the most convenient word uh, to use, but I think of myself more as a, a storyteller uh, who uses any, uh, many modes and means to tell a story. Uh, so, for example, with Stardust, um, which is probably the most choreography I've ever had in a piece from my own company. Uh, the dance may be uh, dealing with the, I tend to think of the movement as uh, kind of interpreting the subtext of the narrative, the emotional life of the character, but uh, in the spine of the piece is definitely the, the character and the, the protagonist and his narrative, his very specific narrative that's told to these texts. Uh, so probably even though I'm a movement-based artist, I tend to think of the work and whether it succeeds or not as whether or not it succeeded theatrically, um, interestingly enough. And um, it's, it's been a challenge trying to figure out what to call it through the years. Um, I think when you say I'm a dance artist, it, it, it has certain expectations, not only aesthetically, but also about content. Um, and when you say a theater artist or a dance theater artist, that has certain um, expectations about physicality and vocabulary and the use of the not use of dance and dance. Um, and it feels like uh, uh, you can offend everybody and, and please some at the same time because uh, it's no matter what the what you call it, it's it's uh, the interdisciplinarity of the work is. Um, uh, fulfilling and also challenging expectations um, at every moment. Well said, and it's true. It's, uh, uh, it's hard to describe exactly why or how it sucks you in, but it does. Mm -hmm. It's so uh, uh, moving and poetic mm -hmm. in that way. Uh, in fact, uh, I, was, I was on the verge of, of, of tears more than once, uh, and was also last night, Ogaio, I can't explain exactly why. Uh, Claudio, you're uh, uh, working with an invented language 
which is a very interesting example of how theater does not necessarily uh, uh, confine itself to words, to storytelling in the traditional sense. It's an opera that you, that, that you invented, yet it's also a, a compelling theatrical event. Even, do, you, do you think that there is a story specifically uh, there? What, uh, um, why did I get those tingles? <laughs> <laughs> There's a simple story there. I mean, uh, after doing... It's working. Okay. Yes. Okay. After working? No. <laughs> After uh, having done a lot of, a lot of uh, works with, uh, with translation, we decided that we should do something without language. So we found this great composer, Paul Barker. He's a uh, British composer. British? Hello? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If not, like a so anyway, so uh, we have found this great composer that he's wor working with a, with a known language or an invented language, mm -hmm. and uh, we thought that it was the moment for us to work with that because we have been traveling a lot with translations. And uh, for example, there's a play that we we should we use to present in the language of the country. I mean, just the thirty percent of it. So if you want to be part of the company, you have to know any language, or you have to talk very bad in a lot of languages. So we learned just some phrases, but um, then we, we realized that we need that, this new step. And we found this composer, he was living in Mexico for a while. We, we were trying to, to connect uh, both uh, companies to work, and finally when he went back to London, it was the right moment to do it. So we have to spend a lot of money to bring him to Mexico. <laughs> but anyway, it was better because he just come for, for a while, he made, made some exercises with our actors, and they destroyed his music, he went back, sent us the new compositions, so he wrote for a specific voices of the actors. I mean, um, so he was very worried because these actors or these singers, they weren't the normal singers that could sing all the things that he could wrote. So he was shocked, but at the end he found that these actors are open to do anything. So the, uh, as, as a normal singer will be afraid of doing something wrong, but the actors, they are not. So they, <laughs> say they become singers, but of their own technique or their own style, I would say. So finally, we have this very complex uh, music score because we have been do done it for many months. So it now it's very, very complex. If there's a professional singer that tries to sing, it's very, very complex. So there was two, two um, decisions to use this language. First, because this work was developed very near to the, to the inside of the actors, because we, we work very closely to therapy processes, where they bring to the, to the room their problems, but with this invented language, they could be talking about this, they could share that without being exposed. So the, the action or the plot is quite simple. It's just uh, a group of artists convoked by a, by a director, and they have to, to, to put, to, to prepare a, a, a new music score for a concert. That's it's quite simple. So you will see that that is also to invite the audience to the room to watch this process. Um, because Paul Barker and I, we decided to do something from the very beginning without nothing. The previous place, the one that you have presented at most of the is we took like five years of research of these, these items. But with this, we decided we don't have anything. So we were in front of six actors, and she, he was like asking me, let's do something, yeah. Something, I don't know. Do something. And, and we started without knowing anything. Just We were just uh, following the desires uh, of, the, of the actors to do something with music. At the end, we have a very simple plot that is this, uh, uh, these differences of uh, capacities that makes a lot of uh, confrontations between the, between the participants.
participants and the concert. But the idea is to invite the audience to see this process, these processes, processes that could be everywhere in an office, not just in an in a artistic process, to join and to see this process, let's say the, the audience, the first audience, the no, no, audition, the first rehearsal, a rehearsal in the middle, and the last rehearsal before the presentation. The, uh, that sounds like a simple structure when you describe it that way. Uh, to be honest, I've always preferred opera that's not in English because uh, the words sound silly, uh, central music and opera. So the idea that you use an invented language is a, a treat for me. Um, I was Catholic once, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, occasionally would attend a service that was in Latin, and I liked it much better that way. Uh, it reminds me, we, we spoke uh, uh, recently about uh, ritual, and yes. theater or performance as a, as a ritual. Uh, some of the structures of our art forms are fairly uh, prescribed. The symphony is slow and then fast and then slow. Uh, a story has an exposition and then uh, conflict and then a resolution, a denouement. Ritual is another alternate structure. Uh, I know that in a new work you're developing, you're looking at uh, uh, old uh, ancient forms of morality plays, um, which were in a way almost a religious experience or meant to be, well, I don't know, maybe overstating it, but it, um, uh, is a ritual a structure in itself? I would like, it, it, it sounds now very difficult to talk, to talk about spiritual things or mystic things in theater, and I'm always seen as very naive mostly from my producer from Europe, they are always looking at me like, oh, they are from Mexico. <laughs> it's true. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> they, are, they think this thing about spirituality is also actual things or whatever. It's actual, it's part of our daily life. I mean, my spiritual search is now, I'm being brave because it's not religious at all. It's just spiritual, you know? And it's the, it's the new search that I'm trying to to talk also with my actors. The first time that I'm talking about these things with someone, with someone, with a lot of people. Uh, because um, I hope you could understand. Um, I have this rule, we are used to have a form of, of, of working, but now to talk about these things is quite complex, you know? Because also you have to have a lot of respect. It could be, it could be a lot of, also, a lot of with distortion. So I have, uh, I, for my new play, I form a group of 14 actors, and until now we have been working for eight months without touching the, the play, just talking about other issues and preparing them for other kind of approaching. Uh, that it was very, it has a lot of force, in, I would say, in the 60s or 70s. There, there's a lot, there was a lot of uh, theater makers that all these the ideas of the ritual or the mystic part uh, be part of the of the creation, and so I haven't. It is, for now, I will start with the with the play, with the. With, uh, but first, I have to talk with them about other things. First, to make group. It's a, it's a long way to make a group. Eight eight months working almost daily, just to awake away awake um, a way of working, a different way of working. That's the idea. Uh, maybe it will be more, more important for them the process than the result. <coughs> mm. <coughs> the uh, presenters often, uh, Angela, have to think a lot about the result, <laughs> eventually. <laughs> you just finished um, a festival in which, uh, over the course of uh, two weeks, uh, you had a variety of international artists working in uh, dance and theater and performance art also a visual arts program. Um, and so during that time, you uh, um, were asked a lot of questions and uh, had a lot of opportunities to try to describe what it was that moved you to invite this or that project. Um, what sort of things did you say in response to the questions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's interesting that ritual should come up in this conversation. Um, and so 
quickly because um, I think the festival really adds a ritual. Um, and I think even in this, this weekend, you, you feel it. It's a, a condensed time frame in which people are coming together, having these shared experiences, moving through, um, certainly at TPA, moving through this, this fully immersive scenario, this immersive platform of artists working in uh, a multitude of disciplines and styles. So it's a place in which people are experimenting. We often talk about the festival being experimental, but I, I really feel like people are, as audience members, you know, they are going into multiple you know, artistic viewpoints and styles, and they're walking into warehouses and engaging in performance art, they're walking into galleries and installations. They're moving through multiple um, time frames and spaces um, and having these shared experiences. Many of them are doing it together, you know, and that's, I think, one of the, the beautiful things about um, the work. In terms of why the certain artists, um, you know, I think all of us, uh, are asking those questions of curators you know, constantly. You know, I you know, there's extraordinary artists everywhere. You know, being in this context with you guys and you knowing you for so many years, yes. you, many years. It's just um, it's phenomenal to be here. You're too young to know anyone for so long. <laughs> 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 but I think for me, it's about you know I'm looking and searching for those artists who are fearless, artists who are you know, this notion of searching. I'd rather, you know, work with artists who are just so committed to the questioning and the searching and their fearless investigations around form, around a concept, around an idea, around a collaboration, that those are the kinds of projects and the artists I want to work with. I mean, TBA is that platform that people who are part of it, they don't have to define themselves by a particular category. It's one of the few places, you know, that's why I wanted to work there, if I was, it's one of the few places that you can be an artist. You know, maybe you're coming from a particular lineage of a particular discipline and honor that, but you can be seen in a, in a different context, you can be seen in a broader context, which I think is imperative for our, our discipline right now, for theater in particular, to not be isolated, to be in a context in which artists are just searching and searching, right? Um, that's what comes for me in one of the most productive and fruitful places around uh, the conversation. I think other things that I was looking for, um, you know, I, I look for, this is a super elusive term, but I think about work that's urgent. You know, all curatorial perspective is super subjective. You know, I have all my artistic criteria, and certainly, you know, I definitely, from my organization, I uh, work really about more experimental forms and ideas, new forms, new concepts. At the same time, for me, I, I always think about it, is this urgent? How will this land in my community? How am I provoking? How am I pushing? How am I like creating a disruption? And will this work create a disruption? And what does it mean to have this this um, this range of work existing in that ten days? What is the conversation between as people are moving through multiple spaces, through the warehouse, through the installation, through the theater space, at the at the opera space, at the rehearsal studio, um, and converging in our late night hub? You know, what is this accumulation of experiences? And what is, what is this accumulation of artistic points of view? And so I start to then think about what is that, um, what is that dialogue between disciplines, forms, and concepts, and how these projects and these ideas fit together? And what is that community communicating as a whole? And then I go back to that sense of urgency. Um, but ritual, as for this edition, it really, um, I was actually looking for intimate rituals that, um, that felt really personal. And emotional, and that is just not sexy in a contemporary art center context right now <laughs> at all. <laughs> That's just a little bit of something that I was. Yeah. 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 She made me thinking something that I was wanting to wanted to say because mm -hmm. you you use this urgent R. Mm -hmm. I like this 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 uh, nomination mm -hmm. word. I, I was thinking in a useful R. That is one of my concerns now, that, they, that the art is useful for the other audience. You know? uh, I like the urgent art. So for me, useful also, I feel like, can you have more spaces where it's actually useful for artists to be free in their imaginations? Untethered, right? And free to explore whatever discipline they want to, whatever, you know, um, whatever, if it's an artist that's working in text and working in, in a visual disciplines or working in other things, that it just, we don't even talk about it anymore. Can we be in a place where the notion of 
similarity doesn't even matter because that's just who we are. We are we can we have more places where multiplicity is the norm and it ceases to be the conversation. And that's useful for me. Yeah. Fearlessness uh, implies taking risk. Yeah. And uh, sometimes taking risk uh, requires a great deal of preparation. Yeah. David, um, you're telling a very personal mm -hmm. story. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks to the support structures of your co-commissioners of the National Dance Project, you were able to spend a fair amount of time on the development of this piece, uh, almost three years, I believe. Yeah. Uh, that's a lot of time to be uh, exploring a story so close to your own. Yes. Yeah. Scary, but essential. <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah, we were really lucky in the cast um, remained together for three years. Uh, uh, and it was really crucial, actually, for a lot of the reasons that were mentioned. I really love the idea of in inventing language, because to me, that's what <coughs> risk taking is about. And I wish it weren't true, but it feels like every piece that I start, either on a micro level, as in what, how are we speaking with our uh, voices in our life, on a macro level, the piece as a whole, how is it conveying meaning? It's, it's always about inventing the language for me and reinventing the language uh, through which the piece will speak. Uh, and that means that it, it, each process is inherently risky because we're trying to figure out, uh, and to me what I mean by that is every piece has this different relationship between text, which is almost always the spine of the word, but then how you, and it's usually narrative, but then how you tell that is a reinvention of language every time. Um, and it feels like uh, with Stardust, um, uh, one of the things that made it so risky was my own presence on stage has always been such a vital part of that language. And it felt like now was the time for me not to be uh, so vital to, to the invention of language uh, uh, and, and uh, in the performance of the piece. Um, and my own narrative, usually autobiographical narrative, mm -hmm. has always been kind of the core of the work. And I felt like this was the time, and why it took a three-year process was uh, we were, I was trying to take consciously and just in terms of the way the piece wanted to communicate so many different risks that each piece is, a, is an opportunity to, if not so much reinvent, to reinvestigate. Mm -hmm. Um, methods and modes of communicating. To me, it's always about communication, but how you communicate, uh, how the work communicates is always different. And that's the one thing, uh, in particular, the National Dance Project is so vital to the commissioners and Red Cat offering us a space for a technical residency uh, before our uh, uh, premier performances. Uh, that amount of time is so vital. And in particular, the interdisciplinary approach to this piece was very different from all of my other work. Uh, there's no direct reference to the narrative in the actual movement that's happening on stage. Um, I think there's a single, no one plays the character. Um, there's no other than sounds. And uh, so we're trying to illuminate his emotional terrain live. And the story is more specific than ever, probably, a more specifically narrative. And the visual imagery is surreal, and how is that being used to tell the story? So, the, so my point is that over time, it took a while to figure out how these different modes of communicating on the heart, on the brain, uh, would combine to tell the story. Um, and then at the core of it all, it took three years working with my amazing dramaturg, Lucy Burns, to hone in on the narrative that's at the core of it. And there was so much reinvention happening that I, I felt really honored to have the time to actually do it. Uh, risk taking takes a lot of time, effort, and this is why it just, uh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we would, the irony is, we would, I don't think we would do it if it weren't so risky, but it doesn't feel great in so many ways. Why do we do it? That's the point. I really do that. You've got a sense before. 
but no. Yeah, what does it look like? What does it yes. feel like? What does that mean? And it's really awkward and uncomfortable and come on talk about that. I was telling Mark that my idea of the school, the theater schools have to be destroyed, and also music schools and dance schools, it has to be just art, selling art. <coughs> Yesterday I was working with, with the musicians that they provide, you provide those great musicians from Calarts, but I was asking them just to shout, just to put with the art bow. Excuse me? The bow. They have to shout. And it's so difficult for them just to do <laughs> And I told them that the way to, to notice an amateur is that they could do the help of the action, you know? Mm -hmm. Even saying that, they don't, they don't they <laughs> So I was dreaming in a school that the, the musicians are taking uh, acting classes. I mean, but not just like a, another class or in a, in a school where just, in a theater school where just singing is not just another um, class or materia, right? That is part of, they have to develop as singers or dancers or, or actors at the same level. It's nice, it's really because I'm still facing this problem. I, I used to have a long processes that could be one year, one year and a half, because I need to, um, to prepare my actors, the musicians have to become actors, the actors have to become uh, musicians, or they have to learn everything, because there's not enough people that is prepared, at least in Mexico. In this whole idea that, I mean, at least for theater, for me there's no more borders if you are a dancer or a singer or a musician, you have to be everything. Mm -hmm. So that's my idea in terms of interdisciplinary or often have to figure out how to define yourself, too. As a, uh, um, when being a presenter or producer or an artist, you're also uh, a fundraiser all the time. Um, it's almost 20 years ago since there was uh, a program in the National Endowment for the Arts here in, in the U.S. called InterArts, which over the course of uh, approximately 10 years or so, really did push uh, uh, and increase awareness of different uh, ways of approaching uh, the creation of art in general, uh, especially investments in art centers. At about the same time that the inter-arts program was uh, eliminated, um, uh, mostly as a result of the uh, <coughs> culture wars that were happening of sorts, they also eliminated all of the uh, fellowships, choreographers, for playwrights, for solo uh, performers. It's a category. Um, was, uh, the only the only direct funding to an individual actually that remains is to writers, because they present no risk to us whatsoever. Stepping in after the, the, the loss of these fellowship programs and the inter-arts, there are exciting developments such as the uh, National Dance Project, which developed, and then more in more recent years, the National Theater Project. It's interesting to see um, uh, these essential and important structures um, try to address a basic need, and I see some artists um, apply to both to see which one <laughs> will work. Um, I don't know in, in, in Mexico what uh, sources of support you go to. Are you also having to define yourself as a theater company one day and then uh, another day a, a new uh, opera creator? It's a great problem. I mean, we have, a, a, I would say, a very good uh, um, ministry. And the Ministry of, of Culture, is, is, they have made a very good institution called FONCA that is really exceptional in all Latin America. We, are, we don't have funds from, from the private, uh, we, just from the government. I mean, it's not enough, obviously. But these are very good, they're very good programs. And they have this great problem, where to put you? No? Mm -hmm. So they, they are inventing, of their, they, because it's managed or advised with many artists, they are open to change these rules. But it's very complex, because they don't know how to name many words. 
So I, we used to apply for music, and for theater, or for everything. We just have an, a grant that we asked for theater many years, and finally we obtained it through music. Mm. So, I mean, it's, it's normal that the mind always tries to put the things in different uh, parts, you know, to select. But um, now the art is completely mixed. So, it, it's still a problem. Yeah, that's a really interesting challenge that, um, you know, I know from probably from all sides, artists and presenters, just, I know I talk <coughs> against that repeatedly. Sometimes it's like, which category do I apply to? And a choreographer, as you mentioned earlier, I usually go for that because I think, well, everybody knows me as a choreographer. But then the spine of the work is theatrical. Um, and it's just, where do I apply? But also, I've often gotten the feedback when they haven't gotten um, funded. It depends on the makeup of the panel. Uh, well, you were really close, but play again next year. We didn't think there was enough dance in it over the next year. You know, if I'm going for a body-based practice fund and stuff, so well, it's a little um, traditional dance. Um, so you kind of, sometimes you feel like you're thinking <coughs> and creating in, in an industry world, but uh, uh, that for sometimes very valid reasons, the world has to think in, or is thinking more in terms of discipline. Uh, and it has sometimes very practical uh, implications of trying to maneuver and it, it, if I could um, put aside the stakes, it's like, right? Sometimes it's fun to be trying to be cunning about it. How am I going to, and sometimes it's very helpful, how am I going to think this project through so that it appeals to a more theatrical, a, the, a panel that's more theater based, which is helpful to my process often. Uh, but uh, more often than not, it can be a little frustrating. But where do I have it? to fit in? You could use it. I used to use it. Mm. When, when, when I'm when I, uh, new, uh, when I met as presenter, and he or she would tell me, no, I'm, no, I'm based on, on opera. Yes, it's an opera. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
round for 50 people and underneath your seat there are scripts. And um, basically it's a, a, a run through a reading of a, of a play that she wrote um, for the audience. And you know, in the description in the book, you know, she is still, um, it's very important for her to be identified um, as a choreographer. That history and that training and that point of view is still really significant and she wanted to have that in, as her signifier. Um, but the piece, like I said, it didn't happen in theater. It's a, it's a theater piece. We're reading a play, you know. And so, how many people did I lose because of that? But what else did it shed light on in terms of that these are complex artists, not defined by one way of um, one identity? But it's a really interesting, complicated, rich world we're in. That I try to listen and be as responsive to the artist as possible. Like, how do you want to be defined? And maybe in this festival you want to identify in this way. Maybe in another time, a different way. But it also can be quite complicated for the presenter because we just want the best mediation possible for that encounter with audience and artists. You know, but how do you have to keep the integrity of how the artist wants to be you know, presented? But it offers up a really interesting conversation that the public might never know about, but goes back and forth, I think, um, are also really um, significant in terms of these conversations we're having on, you know, under the radar. You know. um, yes? I, I want, it's, you know, I am Rodriguez. <laughs>
whereas in a festival and in some of our past editions, we have done things more site-specific and kind of happening all over. People love that. People love to engage and work in unconventional places um, in site. And there's a real, I think, um, curiosity and wonder for that kind of work, changing a situation. When, you know, audiences tell me they want to be part of that they haven't experienced. At the same time, in terms of theater, um, I think our audience in Portland, and I think this is true in a lot of places, still really gravitate towards the word and gravitate towards story as an anchor point. Mm -hmm. And that, that is a much easier access um, or entry point um, across the board. So as somebody's going through, like, okay, what are you presenting this year? The, you know, the look of you know, fear comes across their face and I say, because if this edition happened to be a lot in body, if it a lot of work in the body, I wouldn't call it dance at all. But they're like, well, where's the story? And so there, there's still, like, you know, I still definitely feel like people want to have a, a subverted context and a new way of engaging, but the language is still a powerful um, access point, the story is still, you know, you still want to find it. Um, but I agree, we're on the, the West Coast is a great place to, we're you know, we don't, what we don't have is, um, you know, certain histories, or, you know, in Portland there are no, there are very few, you know, theater companies when I'm in the Bay Area, there's a lot of theater companies, but completely disconnected from the downtown New York scene. I find that very freeing. There's exposure to do and education around what's going on nationally and globally, but there's also quite a, a, this amazing sense of freedom. Um, and our artists, when they come there, often talk about that. It's like, my work was never interpreted in that way before. You know, by having a visual art audience engage in, you know, in see theater and dance works, how else can, um, what, it, it sparks a different dialogue. And I think artists, and I'm speaking for you, so then, I think artists are hungry to have a different conversation, not the same conversation after every piece. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Uh, and I did see that article, and it was a little disconcerting. Uh, but you know, I thought, well, these are the facts. Uh, but, because so I think that that's a really important question. And I have to say, uh, I, I love thinking about that, because I just confronted it from the beginning in a personal way, uh, through culture and race, and you know, my family would come up from Texas, and when I was in the East Village, New York, doing really out there work, and ironically, the work was so grounded in Southern African Americana and history, and so that's what the work was made for, but no one could read it. So it was like my own family was like, what? I don't get it. And the bell went off from the beginning. I'm making work that can't be read, but the community said it's about. That's, that's a challenge. And I knew I wasn't going to change the work. So I felt like just the same way that I would say, well, what did you guys see in the work with my family, with my sisters, who are super smart, but just never seen dance in their life? I thought to give them context and to hear from them, to tell them, um, every artist makes their own choice about how much context they want to give, how much conversation they want to give, but I became very big, again, on micro level, but on macro level. Anytime, any place, I feel like I can, I'm willing to give you as much context or talk about the work. And because I'm speaking in such an avant-garde framework about really culturally and racially um, specific things and for communities that aren't used to seeing this work, and for communities that are used to seeing experimental work who don't have an access in when the loud hip hop music comes on. Um, so for me, it all became about trying to give context. And if I can use an example with Stardust, I am so appreciated you saying that there are these spiritual things embedded in your next piece. Because at the core of, everybody can find what they want in Stardust. At the core of it, there's a very hardcore issue about the nature of God. And in particular, in the African American community and spiritual community, and if a child is looking for his connection with another human being, which is what I'm calling a spiritual dialogue, but even bigger, what's my relationship with the universe as a whole? Uh, and he's ostracized from his religious community because he's queer. That's what's at the core of the piece, is this little boy going, ooh, what's left if God isn't even there for me? And that's a very traditional dialogue told for me, but that is not actually contained in postmodern theater or dance work. So that's pushing boundaries. And this really, I have this total phobia about people thinking I'm going back to my Catholic roots. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's hard. But, for example, with going to the University of Maryland, uh, the, the Curry Smith Center is where we're going to have our world premiere. And, 
was a little bit like, okay, you said you want to have these dialogues. And they asked me, what's the core of the work? And I said, well, it's trying to challenge while creating a dialogue with the African American spiritual community. And they said, great, we'll get together some spiritual leaders from our community. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
your personality because maybe in my case I feel very bored to read something. Mm. Also the findings. I have seen that many of these great or famous uh, artists are this kind of artists that likes to be recognized by their signer, signer. So you will see a, a show of, I, I won't say names, and you will say, oh, he's, no, his he's signature is quite recognizable. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah, okay. <coughs> but there's other kind of personalities that are searching always for this list. But I think that the risk in terms of the audience is, is a way of, uh, of seduction. You have to, to seduce the other to be, to be heard. You know? So this risk of, uh, maybe will have something that will be interesting for the other, for the other to, to see. Because there's so much things to see. Uh, I mean, the options are unlimited. You know? so, so the risk could make a kind of language, a kind of interest for the other because you have to seduce first your audience and then if they are seduced you could say something but the first step is to make them come to the theater you know so the risk is still something interesting for the other in all things it could be in sports or whatever you know, it's part of the, uh, the things that make attraction to the other great we need to uh, have one more uh, question <laughs> comment and then we'll well, I was a yeah. audience member, so I thought I'd speak up with this part of being in college. It's the 60 performances of my history, and four from radar so far. And I, too, am looking for a spiritual experience. And I think it happens when people have a really high level of artistic ability, which takes tremendous amount of